Welcome back, General. As you can probably tell by the title of this video, I'll be providing you an in-depth look at the United States of America's armed forces. This will include the faction's strategy and tactics on the battlefield and its arsenal, including their structures, weapons, vehicles, and infantry roles. Like the previous videos, this one will be quite long, so I recommend grabbing a drink and a snack before proceeding. And feel free to pause the video anytime you wish to take a break. With all that said, Let's begin. With the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, the world found itself in the post-Cold War era, with the United States becoming the premier military and economic superpower on the planet. Roughly a decade later though, the US would find itself embroiled in a global war on terror, getting involved in various conflicts or counter-terrorist initiatives throughout the Middle East. These conflicts eventually came to a close, with the US withdrawing most of its military forces from the region. However, it wouldn't be long until a new organization, known as the Global Liberation Army, would rise up in the republics of Central Asia. This loose federation of warlords, freedom fighters, and terrorists quickly seized the countries of Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, combining them to create the GLA-controlled nation of Aldistan. From here, the GLA established cells in other Middle Eastern countries, and began sending forces into Western China, attempting to establish a new independent state in this remote region. Tensions between the People's Republic of China and the GLA quickly escalated, threatening to ignite into an all-out war between the two. Although the US monitored the situation on the ground, it refrained from getting involved with peacekeeping initiatives, to the disappointment of the UN Security Council. While the United States continues to provide orbital reconnaissance to the Security Council, it has failed to contribute troops to peacekeeping efforts in the region. The Council's refusal to support United States counter-terrorist initiatives in the Middle East in recent years has not been forgotten. USA military forces have remained in port and on base, venturing out only to secure its coastline. When war broke out between the two factions, the USA still didn't unleash its full military might against the GLA. The country did provide some military support to China, though. During the PLA's assault on the city of Balaki in Kyrgyzstan, the US provided air support in the form of B-52 bombers, which carpet-bombed GLA defensive positions in the city. PLA forces were successful in driving the GLA out of Aldistan. However, the organization regrouped in the nearby country of Kazakhstan. At this point, the US contributed some of its military forces to the region in cooperation with China and the UN Security Council in an attempt to maintain peace in the region. However, the GLA were able to successfully reorganize their forces and rally the local populace in support of their cause. This led the reinvigorated GLA to use one of their cells in Turkey to assault and destroy the US-controlled airbase of Inserlik. They then went on to retake toxic storage bunkers in the Aral Sea from the US, and capture the Baikonur Cosmodrome, which was being protected by both US and Chinese forces. With the capture of the Cosmodrome, the GLA could now launch toxin-filled ICBMs at targets all over the world, including the United States. With this threat in mind, the US finally decided to bring its full military might down upon the GLA, rooting out and eliminating every single one of its cells, no matter where they were in the world. The United States Armed Forces were equipped with the most technologically advanced weapon systems. The best weapons of the world have USA stamped on their side. The United States has the most sophisticated arsenal. From its well-equipped and expertly trained rangers, to the top secret particle cannon, the USA side is rarely caught at a technological disadvantage. However, some believe its isolationist policies have softened its war machine. Everyone agrees, though, that it costs plenty of money and power to keep the USA wheels moving forward. The USA had a few famous generals who were specialized in certain tactics, technologies, and weapon systems. The first of these was Air Force General Malcolm Granger. From King Raptors to combat Chinooks, Granger specialized in all things related to aircraft. The second was Marine Corps General Alexis Alexander, who was an expert in superweapons like the Particle Beam Cannon, as well as enhanced defensive systems like the EMP Patriot Missile Launcher. The last was U.S. Army General Towns, who developed offensive and defensive strategies around lasers, 
including the development of both the laser tank and laser defense turret. The USA's military strategy was to make use of its advanced technology and overwhelming firepower to quickly and effectively destroy their opposition. These shock and awe tactics were designed to paralyze the enemy's perception of the battlefield and destroy their will to fight. Such a feat could be accomplished thanks to the USA's Air Force, which was the largest and most well-trained in the world, able to destroy key strategic targets behind enemy lines and provide close air support for its ground forces. One mission that showcased the effectiveness of this strategy was Operation Final Justice, when the US launched an assault on the GLA-controlled city of Baghdad in Iraq. On the outskirts of the city, a large tank battle between the two forces ensued, with the USA's Crusader tanks successfully destroying the GLA's Scorpions. More Scorpions were sent in to engage the Crusaders, but they were stopped dead in their tracks by low-flying Raptors. As the tank division pushed into the city itself, the GLA launched their Scud Storm missiles in an attempt to destroy them. However, the strike landed in front of the division, causing only friendly fire to the GLA's own forces, as well as civilians. The US force pushed through to the center of the city, capturing the palace. Rangers dropped in from Chinooks to clear out garrison structures and support the advancing division. The tanks made their way up a hill towards the GLA base, where the Scud Storm was located. The GLA set up a defensive line of Scorpion tanks at the top of the hill, but this line was quickly demolished by a B-52 bomber, which dropped a fuel air bomb on top of the enemy position. The American tanks moved up and rolled through the GLA base, destroying everything in sight. The force then reached the Scud Storm, destroying the superweapon and securing Baghdad. Another mission, called Operation Stormbringer, involved US forces making an amphibious landing on the coast of Kazakhstan, near the city of Atrau. The objective was to destroy a GLA training camp in the city. Battleships provided offshore fire support for the US forces landing on the beach. Once the beach was secured, American forces were able to move their Tomahawk missile launchers in range of the GLA base. The missiles from these launchers destroyed the Stinger sites guarding the base, which made room for a couple of B-52 bombers to fly in and carpet bomb the area, destroying the base and nearby training facility. With this area cleared, the US brought in a couple of dozers to establish their own base. This would allow them to bring in reinforcements and drive the rest of the GLA forces out of the city. Heavy urban combat ensued, but the US forces continued to receive air support from their A-10s and bombard entrenched enemy positions with their Tomahawks, successfully clearing out the city of all GLA resistance. In addition to defending their base or other strategic positions, the USA made use of several structures to train troops, build vehicles, generate power, and arm their forces with additional equipment. One thing that all US structures had in common was that the personnel inside the buildings would automatically repair any damage. This was unlike the structures used by China or the GLA that required workers or a dozer to repair them. Of course, the US dozer could perform repairs on their own structures too, but it wasn't a requirement thanks to their ability to self-repair. Another aspect that all the structures had in common was that the rangers stationed inside would evacuate if the buildings were destroyed. Typically, larger structures had a greater number of rangers evacuate them. The first and most vital structure of the USA base was the command center. The center consisted of a large rectangular shaped building in the middle. A garage located to the right of this building houses construction dozers. Attached to the back left side of the main building is a smaller square shaped one. Other features include a tower with a large satellite dish at the top and a flagpole next to the garage. Located in front of the main building is a concrete block with the USA symbol on it. A chain-link fence partially surrounds the entire structure. 
The command center was used by US generals to direct and coordinate their forces on the battlefield. The garage housed and assembled construction dozers to expand the base, if needed. Using its satellite dish, the command center would connect to a spy satellite that could periodically scan the battlefield, temporarily revealing any and everything through the fog of war. This allowed the USA General to reveal any enemy forces in the area, including stealth units or structures. Additionally, the command center provided its general the capability to call in reinforcements or other forms of support from outside their local area, such as an A-10 strike or paratrooper reinforcements. Many US generals would call in a spy drone, which was an MQ-1 predator. This drone would loiter over the designated location, revealing any and all enemy forces, including stealthed ones. The drone itself was stealthy, though if detected by the enemy, it could be easily brought down, as it had light armor and no way to defend itself. The second structure was the Cold Fusion Reactor. This building provided power to the US base. The main structure was square-shaped and housed the reactor itself. It had a tall, thin smokestack next to it. Another small building located next to them may have been used as a power monitoring station. The power transformer attached to power lines are located next to the main building. The reactor could be upgraded with control rods, which doubled its power output. An upgraded reactor had a light green glow at the top of the main structure. One could also see sparks emanating from the towers and power lines. The third structure was the supply center. This building had a helipad used by Chinook helicopters to transport collected supplies to the supply center. These supplies would then be picked up by a small crane, which placed them on a conveyor belt and take it to a building for sorting. A larger, rectangular-shaped building used to store additional supplies was next to the helipad, with a large cylindrical tank that was located just across from it. Chinooks would fly back and forth, picking up supplies from a dock or elsewhere, and dropping them off at the center. From here, the supplies would be processed and either put to use in the USA's war effort, or sold to generate funds. The fourth structure was the barracks. Three rectangular-shaped buildings that housed the troops made up the bulk of this structure. A flagpole and small sign with sandbags is near the entrance. It is partially surrounded by a chain-link fence. The barracks is where the US would recruit and train infantry. This included the Ranger, Missile Defender, Pathfinder, and Colonel Burton. Rangers would get the most out of the barracks, as they would be trained to capture neutral tech buildings, or even enemy structures. The general could also put in a requisition for flashbangs, which were delivered to the barracks. Rangers used them to launch at enemy infantry, incapacitating them, even if the enemy were garrisoned in a building. Wounded infantry could enter the barracks and receive medical attention from the doctors stationed inside. The fifth structure was the War Factory. It featured a large rectangular garage where vehicles would be acquired or assembled. Next to the garage was what looked to be a miniature factory of some kind, with two smokestacks. This building may have manufactured vehicle parts, which would then be placed on two conveyor belts leading into the garage. In front of this factory was a small crane, which was used to repair any damaged ground vehicle that rolled up to it. The war factory had a few boxes scattered around it, and a chain-link fence that partially surrounded the structure. The war factory would provide the US General with Humvees, ambulances, Crusader tanks, Paladin tanks, Avengers, Sentry drones, Tomahawk launchers, and microwave tanks. In addition, the war factory could attach tow missiles onto Humvees, which gave them an anti-armor weapon, one that could also be used against aircraft. The War Factory could also equip sentry drones with a heavy machine gun. This allowed the drones to effectively engage enemy infantry. The sixth structure was the airfield. It had two runways from which fighter and light bomber aircraft could take off and land. Next to the runways is a helipad, for helicopters to do the same. Next to the helipad were two Quonset hangars, able to house one plane each. Two more rectangular hangars are located at the ends of the runways, also able to house one plane each. A fence connecting the two pairs of hangars creates a corner, and within this corner is the air traffic control tower, a missile rack, and a couple crates of ammunition. 
This type of airfield could support the Raptor, Stealth Fighter, Aurora Bomber, and Comanche. The ground crews stationed at the airfield could rearm and repair any damaged aircraft. Under orders from the General, these crews could outfit the aircraft with additional armaments. These included countermeasures, which equipped flares onto all American aircraft. When deployed, these flares generated a thermal signature, able to divert incoming missiles, increasing the survivability of the aircraft itself. Laser-guided missiles could be armed on all Raptor and Stealth Fighters, which increased their accuracy and damage against enemy targets. Stealth Fighters specifically could be armed with Bunker Buster Bombs, designed to clear out garrison buildings or GLA tunnel networks. Lastly, Comanches could be armed with rocket pods. A salvo of these unguided rockets was devastating against groups of units or structures. The seventh structure was the supply drop. This was just a simple square-shaped drop pad with a few boxes around it and a smoke signal in the middle. C-130 Hercules transport planes would fly over the drop zone roughly every two minutes, para-dropping six crates from the United Nations. In total, these crates delivered $1,500 worth of supplies. Sometimes a crate would fail to land on the drop pad, requiring the U.S. General to order one of their ground units to collect it. The eighth structure was the Strategy Center. This simple structure featured two square-shaped buildings and silo doors, which housed an underground artillery cannon. Its main entrance is recognizable by the two concrete blocks with the USA symbol painted on each one. At the Strategy Center, the U.S. General could apply one of three battle plans to combat enemy forces on the battlefield. The first of these plans was called Hold the Line. This battle plan signals personnel at the Strategy Center to deploy a concrete wall and sandbags around the structure. More sandbags would be placed on the roof of the second building. These extra fortifications increase the structure's damage resistance. More importantly though, all U.S. units would receive an increase in their armor. The second battle plan was called Search and Destroy. For this plan, the second building in the center would deploy a radar array on top of its roof. This array could detect any enemy stealth units in a wide radius around the structure. This battle plan made all American forces more alert to their surroundings, being on the lookout for enemy forces and increasing the range of their weapons. The third battle plan was called Bombardment. This battle plan ordered the Strategy Center to deploy its underground artillery cannon. This cannon could bombard any nearby enemy ground forces. All American forces would receive an increase in their firepower with the adoption of this plan. In addition to these battle plans, the Strategy Center was responsible for acquiring extra equipment and other means of support for the American general. This included chemical suits, which were given to all American infantry to wear providing them improved protection from nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons. Composite armor, which would be installed on Paladin and Crusader tanks, increasing their damage resistance. Drone armor, which, like composite armor, increased the damage resistance of all drones in the U.S. arsenal. All units could receive advanced training from the center. Once this training was complete, they would gain twice the amount of experience from combat granting them faster promotions to becoming veterans and elites. The Strategy Center could establish new and more reliable supply lines for the American General, allowing them to gain additional funds through collected supplies, supply drops, and captured oil derricks. If a five-star general had access to fuel air bomb support, they could potentially have this upgraded to a massive ordnance airburst bomb, or MOAB, Colloquially known as the mother of all bombs, this ordnance would be dropped on a designated target from a fast-moving B-3 bomber. This bomb generates a massive explosion, sending infantry and vehicles flying through the air and bringing most structures crumbling to the ground. Lastly, surveillance analysts and intelligence officers at the Strategy Center could use gathered intelligence to see through the fog of war and accurately pinpoint the current location of all enemy forces and structures on the battlefield. It's important to note that during the first conflict with the GLA, this type of research used to be conducted at a different building, known as the Detention Camp. This structure was basically a POW camp. It had a large square-shaped building, connected to two smaller buildings on its left and right sides. 
One of these buildings was a garage to house a POW truck. The other one was used to hold additional prisoners. A courtyard was located in front of the buildings and surrounded by a barbed wire fence. One guard tower with a searchlight kept watch over the courtyard. The detention camp held prisoners for interrogation. Interrogators could use the information gained from these POWs to locate enemy movements and positions on the battlefield. As previously mentioned, these camps were only utilized during the first conflict against the GLA, and were phased out by the time of the Zero Hour conflict. In order to protect their bases, US generals had a couple of defensive structures they could build. The first and most common of these defenses was the Patriot Missile System. This missile launcher was placed on a small platform and could target enemy ground units and aircraft. They could even target incoming enemy missiles like the Scud. The Patriot system would launch a salvo of four missiles at a hostile target, causing significant damage. They were highly effective against armored vehicles. Multiple Patriot missile systems that were built in close proximity to each other could share targeting data, allowing multiple launchers to focus fire on a singular target, destroying it more quickly. The Patriot missile did have some trouble locking on and tracking infantry units. To better counter enemy infantry, the US General could construct a firebase. The firebase was a defensive structure that featured a 155mm cannon surrounded by sandbags and barbed wire. The cannon can fire shells at a considerable distance against enemy ground units. If enemy units got close enough to the firebase, they could be finished off by four troops garrisoned behind the sandbags. Missile defenders could eliminate armored vehicles, and pathfinders or rangers could pick off enemy infantry with ease. Unlike the Patriot missile system, the firebase could still function without power. If the firebase was destroyed, then all infantry garrisoned around it would be killed in its destruction. The most advanced weapon system in the US arsenal was the Particle Uplink Cannon. This weapon could fire a sustained beam into the Earth's atmosphere. The beam is then reflected off an orbital mirror back down onto the designated target. The structure has a rectangular building with satellite dishes used to link up and track the satellite mirrors needed to reflect the beam. A control tower to activate and monitor the beam is located next to this station. Both buildings are partially surrounded by a fence. In front of them is a silo, which contains the beam weapon itself. When it's ready to fire, the silo opens up, revealing a dish with five smaller beams concentrating their energy to this central dish. While not as devastating in comparison to the GLA Scud Storm or China's nuclear missiles, the particle cannon was highly accurate, able to concentrate its beam on a single target, generating enough heat on impact to destroy all but the most fortified structures. More importantly though, the satellite mirror reflecting the beam could be slowly adjusted. This let the American general move the beam, hitting multiple targets before it had to be shut off. The particle cannon was especially effective at destroying GLA buildings, as it would destroy the hole left behind after the initial structure's collapse, preventing them from rebuilding it. The cannon consumed a lot of power. If the power was cut while the particle beam was active, it would immediately shut off. Once power was restored, the beam would reignite, continuing its attack on the target. The particle cannon had a short recharge time compared to the other superweapons, making it capable of being used more often. It also acted as a great defensive weapon against enemy forces, as it greatly reduced the chance of friendly fire and other collateral damage. The USA has some of the most well-trained infantry, with each soldier performing their assigned task with the utmost efficiency. The first of these infantrymen was the Ranger. What's the mission, sir? There is no fighting man like the USA Ranger. Trained with the latest techniques and armed with the best weapons, the Ranger is a low-cost, effective weapon in numbers. The Ranger was the standard infantryman during the USA's war against the GLA. The Ranger was armed with an M16A2 rifle to effectively engage enemy infantry with. They could capture neutral or enemy buildings with the proper training. When armed with flashbang grenades, they could quickly incapacitate enemy infantry, including those inside buildings. The rangers could even launch these grenades from inside their own garrisons. 
A three-star American general could request ranger reinforcements from outside the battlefield. These rangers would arrive by para-dropping onto the designated location by way of a C-130 transport plane. There were three levels to this support power. The first one would para-drop five rangers at the target location from a single C-130. The second would para-drop ten rangers. And the third would para-drop twenty rangers from two C-130 transports. The US General could have rangers para-drop behind enemy lines in order to wreak havoc on an enemy base, or cut off their supply lines. While rangers were trained to take on enemy infantry, their lack of any anti-tank weaponry made them highly vulnerable to armor and aircraft. To counter vehicular threats, the US had the Missile Defender. Got my missile launcher right here! The Missile Defender was armed with what looks to be either an MK-153 Small or FGM-148 Javelin. The Defenders could devastate hostile armor, and bring enemy aircraft crashing to the ground. The Missile Defender had the unique ability to laser lock onto a single enemy vehicle. This allowed the Defender to continuously launch rockets at the targeted vehicle until it was destroyed. A squad of defenders laser locking onto a single vehicle would quickly reduce it to scrap. Sometimes, American generals needed more specialized infantry to counter the enemies, and provide them with important scouting information. To accomplish such tasks, three-star generals would recruit Pathfinders. Scope cleaned and mounted. These advanced scouts for the USA infantry are lethal to enemy infantry. With a long-range sniper rifle, a Pathfinder can take out an enemy soldier before he is even seen. The Pathfinder was armed with what looks to be an HNK PSG-1 sniper rifle. This rifle could easily take out enemy infantry at long range, without revealing the position of the Pathfinder, thanks to the sniper being outfitted with a ghillie suit that kept him camouflaged. Moving would break his camouflage, though. Unlike other infantry units that can be seen when inside a building, the Pathfinder could garrison one without the enemy knowing he was there. But if the enemy had stealth-detecting equipment, they could reveal the Pathfinder's location no matter where he was hiding. Once discovered, the Pathfinder could easily be taken out by hostile forces, especially vehicles. Sometimes, whenever an American vehicle was destroyed, a member of the crew would eject. These crewmen were known as pilots. I have experience. Normally, Pilots are specifically those who eject out of aircraft that have been shot down. But in game, they are any veteran crewman who survives the destruction of their vehicle. Pilots were completely unarmed, but they could run fast. Higher ranking pilots could run even faster, giving them a higher chance to get away from hostile forces. Once back at the US base, the pilot could recrew any ground vehicle or aircraft, passing their previous experience along to the new vehicle and its crew. There were a few other specialty soldiers that saw limited action during the USA's war with the GLA. The first of these was the CIA agent. What's the directive? CIA agents were specifically utilized in the mission Black Gold during the Zero Hour conflict. This is when the US conducted a large air operation in order to seize the GLA-controlled Amasbad oil fields in Iran. Three CIA agents infiltrated the region before the operation started securing a few supply crates. These agents hid in tents to await arriving American forces, who they could assist in the battle. The agents were armed with a machine pistol that could quickly take out enemy infantry. They also carried timed and remote demo charges, which could be used to destroy enemy buildings. Another specialty soldier utilized by the US was the biohazard technician. These technicians wore a chemical suit and were armed with a sprayer to decontaminate an area of toxins or nuclear radiation. These technicians played an active role in decontaminating toxic bunkers in the RLC before the GLA recaptured them. They were also active at the Baikonur Cosmodrome before the GLA took over the facility. There were soldiers known as infantry officers at the Cosmodrome too, though there isn't much information available on them. We only see these officers at the Cosmodrome, and a few are standing around at the celebration of the USA's triumph over the GLA stronghold in Akmola. Last, but certainly not least, was the USA's most well-known commando, 
Colonel Burton. You want the best? Here I am. There's a bit of a discrepancy with Colonel Burton's main weapon. In his profile picture, he's wielding an M134 minigun. However, according to the General's Manual, Burton is armed with a sniper rifle. Yet, the weapon that he holds in-game looks like some kind of burst-fire rifle. Each burst of Burton's weapon took down enemy infantry quickly, and was even powerful enough to destroy light vehicles. Colonel Burton's stealth training allowed him to move across the battlefield without being noticed, except by stealth-detecting units or structures. Burton could even scale cliffs, which gave him access to areas that other infantry couldn't reach. He carried a knife that he could use to stealthily take out enemy infantry. He was also armed with both timed and remote demo charges. The timed demo charge could be placed on a structure, and would explode when the timer reached zero. Remote demo charges could be placed on multiple structures, and then detonated at the same time with a remote. Colonel Burton participated in several missions during the war against the GLA. A few of the more notable ones included Operation Treasure Hunt, where Burton assisted American forces in rescuing three captured Comanche pilots who had been shot down over the GLA-controlled village of Al-Hanad in Yemen. Burton also supported American forces during Operation Desperate Union in southeastern Kazakhstan, where a rogue Chinese general joined up with the GLA and was supplying the organization with PLA equipment. Burton scouted out the area, eliminating enemy patrols and wreaking as much havoc as he could behind enemy lines. This bought the US general time to build up their forces and launch assaults to destroy the GLA and rogue PLA generals' bases. During the Zero Hour conflict, Burton supported American forces in escorting supply trucks to a warehouse in Somalia. Colonel Burton and PLA agent Black Lotus worked together in a joint operation to infiltrate and destroy a GLA toxic research lab in Mount Elbrus, Russia. Burton and his team freed American POWs and liberated some of their captured equipment from the GLA. This allowed the force to fight their way to the nearby mountain, which the colonel scaled so that he could plant demo charges at the summit. Once Black Lotus had retrieved the information from the lab, Burton detonated the charges, causing an avalanche that destroyed the lab at the base of the mountain. The US made use of several practical and advanced ground vehicles. One thing that all of these vehicles had in common was that they could deploy one of three small drones for battlefield support. The first of these was the Scout Drone, which looked like a smaller version of the MQ-1 Predator Spy Drone that one-star American generals could deploy. These drones would increase the vehicle crew's sight range, allowing them to see enemy forces further away. In addition, they could detect stealthed enemy units, demo traps, and mines. Even though the Scout Drone was the cheapest, it could usually keep pace with its parent vehicle. The second was the Battle Drone, this cylindrical-shaped flyer was armed with a small machine gun that could take out enemy infantry attacking the American vehicle. The drone was also equipped with a repair torch, which it used to repair any damage the vehicle it was assigned to sustained. The battle drone was the slowest of the three, sometimes unable to keep up with its parent vehicle. The third was the Hellfire drone. This was the fastest-moving drone, easily keeping up with its parent vehicle. The drone was named after its armament, which were Hellfire missiles. These were effective against both infantry and vehicles. It was the most expensive of the three drones, though. Anti-air weapon systems could easily shoot these drones down. Drone armor from the Strategy Center extended their survival chance. New ones could be deployed by vehicle crews. If the parent vehicle was destroyed, then the drone would crash to the ground. The only two vehicles in the U.S. arsenal that didn't have one of these support drones was the Sentry and the Construction Dozer. Lay in the foundation. More like a front loader rather than a dozer, its primary function was to construct U.S. military bases and defenses practically anywhere. While U.S. buildings could repair themselves, the dozer could contribute to the process, repairing them faster. While the dozer was unarmed, it could potentially run over enemy infantry that got too close. 
but if there was a region laced with mines or demo traps, the dozer could be given the dangerous task of digging up and disarming these explosives. Once the dozer had finished constructing a war factory, the US general could use it to deploy sentry drones. The sentry drone made for an excellent scout, due to how quickly it could move across the battlefield, and the powerful sensors were able to see through the fog of war. These sensors could even detect nearby enemy stealth units. When not moving, the sentry drone is camouflaged. By default, the drones are unarmed, but an American general could outfit them with machine guns from the war factory. These slow-firing weapons were effective against infantry, allowing the sentry to ambush and gun them down with ease. Once detected, the drone didn't last very long in a fight, especially against enemy vehicles. Another vehicle in the U.S. arsenal that was lightly armored and quick-moving was the Humvee. Got room for five! The high-mobility, multi-purpose-wheeled vehicle was the primary ground transport for American infantry. It could carry up to five infantrymen, who could fire their weapons at nearby enemy units from inside the vehicle. Missile defenders inside Humvees were a particularly deadly combination. The Humvee had a machine gun turret on the roof. Tow missiles could be attached to the turret, providing the vehicle with a decent anti-armor and air weapon. If the vehicle took significant damage, it was imperative that any infantry inside bail out, since the destruction of the Humvee meant everyone inside was also killed. The Humvee was the most versatile vehicle in the US arsenal, as there were two modified versions of it. The first of which was the Ambulance. Need some medical attention? The Ambulance was a Humvee that provided both medical and mechanical support to wounded infantry and damaged vehicles within its vicinity. It could carry up to three soldiers who could receive medical aid inside. Other than being supported by a battle or hellfire drone, the vehicle was unarmed. Special armor on the vehicle made it immune to the effects of corrosive toxins or radiation in a contaminated area. In addition, it was equipped with a detox sprayer, which could decontaminate a toxic or irradiated region. The last modified Humvee was called the Avenger. Defensive laser systems. The Avenger was the USA's primary anti-aircraft vehicle, armed with dual laser guns on the back. These lasers were very effective against aircraft, taking them down in a matter of seconds. At the front of the vehicle was a laser designator, used to paint any enemy ground targets. The painted targets were more susceptible to damage from other allied units. The designator sat between two small point defense lasers. As their name implies, these would destroy incoming rocket or missile projectiles. The Avenger could use all of its laser weapons at the same time, making it a highly effective support vehicle. The downside was that it was slow moving and couldn't destroy any ground targets unless it had a battle or hellfire drone. It was also expensive to construct due to all its advanced laser weaponry. The Avenger was often utilized to support the USA's main battle tank, which was called the Crusader. USA Armor Division. The Crusader's primary edge over the GLA's or China's main battle tanks was its powerful cannon and armor the latter of which could be further improved with composite armor from the Strategy Center. The tank had a decent movement speed and wasn't too expensive to build, so American generals could field a number of them on the battlefield. A C-130 would periodically paradrop a single Crusader tank onto a captured reinforcement pad. As strong as the Crusader was, it could be overwhelmed by hostile firepower especially if it came in the form of rockets, such as with the GLA Stinger Sights and Rocket Buggies. To counter these threats, a one-star USA general could requisition the most powerful tank in the military's arsenal, the Paladin Tank. Preserving Freedom An advanced prototype, the Paladin Tank fires a jet-assisted shell and automatically targets enemy missiles with its small, powerful laser. While more expensive than the Crusader, the Paladin tank had better armor and jet-assisted shells, which could do greater damage to enemy vehicles or structures. It also had a point defense laser on top of the turret. Like the PDS systems on the Avenger, the one on the Paladin would destroy incoming enemy rockets or missiles before they could hit the tank, though some could still get through. Sometimes, the PDS could be used to instantly kill enemy infantry that got too close to the Paladin. 
though the US had a much more effective vehicle for dealing with infantry, called the microwave tank. Microwave weapons cleared for battle. By default, the microwave generated a wave of heat in a circular radius around itself. Any enemy infantry that were caught within this heat field would quickly catch fire and be killed. This made the vehicle immune to hijackings by GLA hijackers, so long as the field remained active. The tank's main weapon could be used to direct its heat wave at an enemy structure or garrison building. These microwave frequencies were powerful enough to disable the electronics of any structure, effectively shutting them down for as long as the wave was maintained. Sustaining this kind of attack, however, meant that the microwave tank couldn't utilize its heat field. The attack couldn't be used against vehicles either. Against garrisoned buildings, this heat wave could instantly clear them of hostile infantry. Another effective way of dealing with structures was through the use of long-range artillery, and the vehicle used to provide this support was the Tomahawk Missile Launcher. Long-range ballistics. The Tomahawk Launcher was armed with a BGM-109G ground-launched cruise missile. This missile was excellent at taking out targets from range, doing considerable damage. It could even track moving targets to a certain extent. The launcher had a fairly quick reload time, though it did need other vehicles around to protect it, as the missile had a minimum range and only light armor to protect the vehicle itself. There were two other ground vehicles the US utilized during the war against the GLA. The first was the POW truck. The POW truck was used to transport any captured POWs to a detention camp or elsewhere for interrogation. These trucks were seen during Operation Guardian Angel, where a U.S. general was tasked with protecting retreating divisions from pursuing GLA forces through a mountain pass in northeastern Kazakhstan. The second vehicle was called the Supply Truck, not to be confused with those trucks used by the PLA to collect supplies. These trucks were used during the mission Defending the Docks, which took place off the coast of Somalia. In total, 10 of these trucks were brought ashore to the docks via amphibious transports. Once all had arrived, U.S. ground forces, supported by offshore naval warships, escorted the trucks to a warehouse to deliver their supplies. Fielding the world's largest air force, the U.S. had a variety of aircraft at its disposal, used to transport equipment and troops, establish air dominance over the battlefield, and provide support for its ground forces. The first, and perhaps the most important of these craft, was the Chinook transport helicopter. I got the goods. The CH-47 Chinook is the workhorse of the U.S. military forces. It was primarily tasked with acquiring supplies from a depot or stash using a net and delivering them to the center. They could carry about $600 worth of supplies, more if the American general had established additional supply lines. The Chinook could carry up to eight infantrymen, transporting and dropping them off anywhere on the battlefield. It could carry a couple of vehicles too. However, the helicopter was unable to gather supplies carrying infantry or vehicles due to the increased weight of the garrisoned units. Rangers were specifically trained to perform combat drops from the Chinook. When the helicopter hovers over a civilian building garrisoned by hostile troops, the Rangers will rappel down some ropes onto the roof of the building. The Rangers would then quickly make their way inside, clearing out the enemy and taking the garrison for themselves. While the Chinook was the primary transport helicopter for the US, the faction's primary attack helicopter was the Comanche. Flying low. The RAH-66 Comanche was armed with multiple weapon systems to engage enemy ground forces and buildings with. The first was a 20mm nose cannon, which could quickly take out infantry. The second were four Hellfire anti-tank missiles that, in combination with the cannon, could take out any vehicles. The third were rocket pods, which first had to be equipped onto the Comanche from the airfield. The Comanche pilots would typically launch a salvo of rockets from these pods against bunched up units or a single structure, causing significant damage. The downside to this attack was that if the Comanche needed to maneuver, it had to cease fire. The Comanche was fast and maneuverable, able to quickly make its way across the battlefield, launch a strike, and then exfiltrate the area. 
It was quite vulnerable to anti-aircraft weapon systems, and could be shot down if it overstayed its welcome. For airplanes, the USA's primary multi-role fighter was the Raptor. Let's give him an air show! The F-22 Raptor was the plane most commonly seen throughout America's war against the GLA. It could take off from not only land-based airfields, but aircraft carriers as well. It was armed with four missiles that could strike both ground and air targets. When armed with laser-guided missiles, the Raptor could more reliably take out its targets. Even though the Raptor was fast-moving, it could still be targeted and destroyed by anti-air weapon systems. Countermeasures increased the aircraft's chance of survival, especially after striking targets that were well behind enemy lines. The GLA made use of a variety of tunnel networks to hide, protect, and maneuver their forces underground or inside mountains. The entrances to these tunnels were sometimes well protected by Stinger sites and RPG troopers. American generals, who didn't want to risk their Raptors, would deploy stealth fighters to deal with these entrances. Smooth and sleek. Specifically, the stealth fighter was an F-117 Nighthawk. It was more akin to a light ground attack bomber than a fighter, as the plane could only use its two missiles against ground targets. Thanks to its unique design, the stealth fighter remained camouflaged until the moment it discharged its missiles onto the designated target. Other stealth detecting systems could see through its camouflage before then, though. This plane was the only one that could be equipped with bunker buster bombs from the airfield. These bombs were highly effective at clearing garrison civilian buildings and GLA tunnel networks, as the bomb would penetrate deep underground before exploding. This explosion would cause units inside the tunnels to immediately exit lest they be killed. These bombs could also be used against enemy units on the surface, with the underground explosion occasionally throwing vehicles into the air, damaging and possibly destroying them. Even with Bunker Buster Bombs, the Stealth Fighter still wasn't the best choice for leveling entire enemy base structures. For that task, the US utilized the Aurora Bomber. Avionics Online. The Aurora Bomber was the most advanced strategic bomber in the US arsenal. Its ability to travel at supersonic speeds meant it could reach its target quickly. However, the Aurora could only sustain these speeds for so long. On its return flight, the craft traveled much slower and therefore, was more vulnerable to being shot down. The Aurora was armed with a high explosive bomb that could destroy most enemy structures in a couple of strikes. While powerful, the bomber was also very expensive, making it costly for the US general to replace. So if the bomber was shot down before it fully destroyed an enemy building, the opposing general may have time to repair it before the American general could bring in new Auroras to finish the job. However, American generals did have access to a variety of off-map air support to destroy enemy structures and ground forces. One of the more popular planes that three-star generals would call in was the A-10. The A-10 Thunderbolt II was one of the most powerful CAS, close air support, aircraft available. While not stealthy or fast like the Stealth Fighter or Aurora Bomber, the plane was incredibly durable, able to absorb a great deal of anti-air fire before finally being downed. And by then, the single A-10, or squadron of A-10s, would have completed its strike. Like all planes in the US arsenal, the A-10 could make use of countermeasures to increase its survivability. There were three levels to this CAS strike available to the American general. In the first, a single A-10 would come in to strafe and bombard the targeted location. This level was good against a small group of enemy units or a defensive structure. The second included two A-10s to strafe and bomb the target. The third would bring in three A-10s, which could destroy almost any enemy base building or finish off an already damaged one. For heavy bombers, the US utilized the B-52 Stratofortress. The B-52 was used extensively as the USA's primary heavy bomber during the war against the GLA. It was common to see the plane conducting carpet bombing runs to destroy GLA bases and fortified positions. Five-star generals were also known to use the bomber to conduct both a leaflet drop and a fuel air bomb strike. The leaflet drop would see the bomber dropping leaflets of propaganda onto enemy units. The sharpest blow strikes an enemy's will to fight. A leaflet drop in an enemy's camp saps morale and reduces the will of his units to resist. 
Enemy infantry and vehicle crews who read the propaganda become so demoralized that they lose all will to fight for a short time. Eventually, the effects of the propaganda wear off, but by then, it may be too late for the enemy to conduct an attack or defend their base. While demoralized, the US general may take the opportunity to conduct another strike on the enemy. Instead of leaflets, a B-52 would be called in to drop a fuel air bomb onto the target. The fuel air bomb was a thermobaric weapon. When detonated, it created a large explosion that would destroy any units caught within the blast radius. Some defensive structures could be destroyed with it too, though more durable base buildings typically survived. More importantly though, a US general could acquire an upgrade for this support power from the strategy center. This upgrade replaced the B-52 with a B-3 bomber. The B-3 bomber was basically just a B-2 bomber. It was fast moving and capable of delivering a variety of ordnance onto a target, but it was mostly used to drop the most powerful bomb in the US arsenal. This was the Massive Ordnance Airburst Bomb, or MOAB, more commonly known as the Mother of All Bombs. When dropped on the designated target, it would create a massive explosion, instantly destroying infantry, vehicles, and most structures. The blast was so powerful that some units were literally thrown into the air by it. The last aircraft used for extended CAS support to American generals was the Spectre Gunship. Spectre Gunship, standing by. The Spectre Gunship was typically reserved for five-star generals. This aircraft could be seen as the next evolution of the AC-130 Spectre. Unlike its former counterpart, the aircraft used two jet engines on its tail to soar swiftly across the skies. It also utilized a variable sweep wing design. The Spectre was armed with dual 20mm M61 Vulcan guns, a buffer's 40mm cannon, and a 105mm cannon. When approaching its target, the Spectre flew with its wings swept back. Once it arrived at said target, the wings would be deployed straight, slowing the aircraft while it circled the area. While circling, the Spectre would pound the target zone with all its guns, destroying anything within the area. The aircrew would make minor adjustments for their guns, so long as they stayed within the firing zone. Once the Spectre had completed its task, or ran out of ammo, its wings would sweep back, allowing it to quickly exfiltrate the area. Like the A-10, the Spectre was very durable, absorbing a lot of anti-aircraft fire before being brought down. The last aircraft, which I've already mentioned throughout this video, was the C-130 Hercules. This was the primary transport plane for the USA, delivering supplies, troops, and equipment to the battlefield, by way of drop zones, para drops, and captured reinforcement pads. Not only did the US have the largest air force in the world, it also had the largest navy. There are a couple of key operations where naval vessels played a direct role in supporting US ground forces. The first of these vessels was the battleship. Offshore artillery. Naval battleships played major roles in operations Stormbringer in Kazakhstan and defending the docks in Somalia. In both these operations, multiple battleships used their six long-range triple-barreled cannons to bombard GLA coastal positions. These bombardments provided much-needed fire support for the American ground forces. Battleships would also act as escorts for the USA's aircraft carriers. Protecting the coast. Aircraft carriers provided vital air support for American ground forces. One carrier, the USS Daedalus, was part of the naval strike force off the coast of Somalia. Raptors would take off from a runway on the deck of the carrier to conduct bombing runs against GLA forces. When the Raptors returned, they landed on a secondary runway and taxied over to the original one. The Raptors would rearm and receive repairs from the Daedalus's crew. Any Raptors that were shot down while out conducting their sorties would be replaced by new ones from below the deck of the ship. Another carrier, called the USS Reagan, was stationed in the Mediterranean. It was destroyed by the GLA when they captured one of the USA's particle beam cannons, and used it against the ship. In addition to the battleships, the US utilized smaller patrol boats to help protect their fleets. These were armed with a machine gun and a couple of torpedoes. 
It's important to note that these patrol boats look exactly the same as a couple of the boats used by the GLA, though this is simply a case of the developers reusing game assets. Finally, the last ship used by the US Navy was the Amphibious Transport. As its name implies, this LCAC, landing craft air cushion, could transport infantry and vehicles from ship to shore. The vessel was responsible for transporting and dropping off US supply trucks during the Defending the Docks mission, and was used to land troops on the beach in Operation Stormbringer. Depending on the rank of the USA generals, they could request special units and other support columns from outside their area of operations. I've already gone over nearly all of these, like the Spy Drone, Pathfinder, and Fuel Air Bomb. A three-star USA general could call in emergency repairs for their vehicles on the front lines. The support power would dispatch crews out to vehicles anywhere on the battlefield to provide fast and immediate repairs, even during the heat of battle. The repair crews had three levels based on experience and rank. These levels dictated how much repair work the crew could perform on the American vehicles. There you have it, General. A detailed overview of the United States Armed Forces. More information on the USA's most famous generals, Granger, Towns, and Alexander, will be provided to you in the future, including information regarding the unique capabilities and arsenals that each one brought to the US military. While the US was initially hesitant to get involved in a prolonged war against the GLA, its commitment of armed forces throughout the Middle East proved integral in weakening the faction, including assaulting the GLA stronghold in Ekmola, killing many of the organization's top commanders, and stopping the insidious Dr. Thrax from launching toxin-filled ICBMs against Europe and North America. The US ultimately pulled out of the war due to the subsequent loss of its Mediterranean fleet and an attack by the GLA off the coast of California but its commitment of armed forces was essential in helping China finish off the organization, finally bringing the war to an end. <laughs>